Hello, my name is Aaron Bastani. Welcome to Downstream here on Navara Media. Before we go any further, I want you to do two things. Firstly, like this video. Second, subscribe to the channel. It doesn't cost you a thing, and it means so much to all of us here at Navara Media. Without general elections, without freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, without the free battle of opinions, life in every public institution withers away, becomes a caricature of itself, and bureaucracy rises as the only deciding factor. So said Rosa Luxemburg, who also said, freedom is always the freedom of dissenters. But is the left no longer able or willing to defend freedom of speech and expression? Or is this simply a right-wing canard, with censorious conservatives saying as much to divert from the fact it's they who are the ones trying to shut down debate. In recent years, particularly here on YouTube, but increasingly in print and broadcast media too, the left has been frequently depicted as opposed to some of the most fundamental freedoms it once defended in decades and centuries past. Is there really no smoke without fire? Joining me to discuss the politics of free speech crises and cancel culture today is the editor of Tribune magazine, Ronan Burtonshaw. Ronan. Welcome to Downstream. Happy to be here, Aaron. How are you keeping, Ronan, in these difficult times, in the in the tail end of the COVID-19 pandemic? I, I have no complaints. Um, it's a, obviously a difficult time for all of us, but uh, but I have a, a general sense that uh, people have much worse things going on than myself. So just get on day to day. And before we proceed very quickly, can you tell our audience about Tribune and why, you know, I think it... it I think you're a great guest for this because I think anybody who has to edit a magazine has to obviously have a certain relationship to freedom of speech, either assert it, enable it, or, or, or to shut it down. Uh, what is Tribune magazine? A little bit about its history and, and your role as editor. So Tribune um, is one of the longest standing publications on the British left. It was founded in the 1930s uh, out of the movement to try to build a, a united front and popular front um uh, in defense of uh democracy against fascism in europe it was the kind of british expression of that so parts of the left wing of the labor party who were trying to um work together with other parties on the left the independent labor party the communists and so on um in uh, in an anti-fascist uh, initiative um and then it became for, for most of its history uh the voice of the labor left uh, was edited for a time by Nye Bevan, who, of course, uh, went on to found the, the NHS, was edited for quite a long period of time by Michael Foote, who went on to become Labour leader, um, and has uh, has had an excellent record um, in many areas. I mean, um, Tribune was the first publication uh, in, in Britain uh, to call for the boycott of South African goods. It was the, the publication which gave the uh, the first platform in Britain to Nehru and uh, to make the case for Indian independence. Um, it, uh, it was one of the publications that built the argument around um, the Equal Pay Act and Barbara Castle and those, those people were involved with it. So uh, it has a great tradition, but obviously in our particular case, um, Tribune, went into some severe difficulties in the 2000s, um, went, went to the wall a number of years ago. Um, we uh, developed it again, um, uh, and uh, we've got ourselves to a stage now where we've got uh, 15,000 subscribers, and um, we're out four times a year in print, but every day online, um, and have managed to, to get to a certain degree of sustainability, which is, uh, which is fantastic in the, in the two and a half years since our relaunch. Never easy, but you've done you've done very very well. I guess first point to start is Ronan. You know, obviously, Tribune has a history, a very storied history, as you just said, of bringing together a, a wide range of opinions on the left. I mean, how how has Tribune historically engaged with the issue of freedom of expression, freedom of spe speech? You know, ha have certain arguments or people been off limits? How how has that boundary, to the best of your knowledge, obviously, we're going back to nineteen thirty seven. How's that generally been kind of policed? In general, Tribune has been very strongly supportive of the rights of free speech, and this is for a, a number of reasons. Um, obviously, some of the leading figures within Tribune and its uh, tradition were big free speech advocates on the left. Um, one of those was Michael Foote, and Tribune held rallies throughout the uh, 1940s in defense of the right to uh, criticize uh, the, the government and its policy and its handling um, of the Second World War, and particularly, uh, obviously, the policy of, of appeasement, um, which Tribune and its leading figures were against. 
Tribune also, interestingly, had uh, George Orwell as its literary editor for a long period of time. Another story that I think people are not so aware of is that the uh, uh, G- George Orwell's um, uh, Animal Farm, which, uh, of course, was a scathing critique of the uh, Soviet system um, and one which, of course, people may have their own critiques of on the left. Uh, but the introduction to it, which, uh, which discussed um, problems of censorship in Britain, was itself ironically uh, censored um, <laughs> and this was something that uh, the Tribune took up the cause over. I think throughout its uh, early years Tribune reflected the reality of what was going on in Britain with censorship and the fact that it was disproportionately targeting the left. One of the big canards um, as you raised in your intro of the right's current narrative around freedom of speech in Britain is that Britain is uh, a country which has a storied record of defending free speech. And that just isn't actually true. It may have been true in the days when Karl Marx arrived in Britain as a refugee and Britain was seen to be a, a relatively free country for those who are fleeing oppression elsewhere. Um, but it hasn't been for a 100 years or more. Uh, when you look back to things like, for instance, the First World War, uh, some of those who are very close to the early Tribune founders, like, for instance, Bertrand Russell, um, were locked up for opposing uh, Britain's involvement in the First World War on left-wing grounds on the basis that it was an imperial slaughter. Um, he, he was joined by people like John McLean, Willie Gallagher, major political figures imprisoned uh, for their stances on, on a war. But this is not just like a historical question. Censorship has run through um, the major institutions in British society throughout the 20th century. You've got the early days of, for instance, um, uh, book publishing, and people forget that Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses, was banned for its first decade at Britain, something that's been kind of disappeared from, from official histories, but is absolutely essential to understand that development. That didn't just end then, as late as the 1980s, you had books like Spycatcher uh, about MI5 and and its activities that were that was banned, and The Economist had to run a review of that in every other country in the world except Britain, where it published a blank page. Um, early cinema, uh, incredible films like Battleship P- Potemkin, uh, and in fact, almost all of early Soviet cinema was banned in Britain. Um, some of it was banned directly. Battleship Potemkin was banned in case it incited uh, communist revolution in Britain. Uh, but uh, almost all the, the rest of the kind of pioneering early Soviet cinema was banned simply by ex- making it impossible for it to come into the country and destroying it when, um, when there were efforts to bring it in. And it had to be shown um, by activists on an underground scene. Um, this goes through all the way through the 20th century. And it's not just like radical left stuff. You've got movies like Marlon Brando's Wild One Band for antisocial activity. Movies about drugs like Trash and Trip and so on. Banned because they're, you know, too explicit on, on, on the drugs front. Um, and, and it's... It's a fundamental part of much of the 20th century history of Britain is that there is a culture of of, uh, of censorship. And it, it it is still something, I have to say, that that's in place today. And I know we're going to discuss a bit more now. Um, but you can't really understand the debate that we're having about free speech without accepting that speech that challenges power, that challenges the establishment, that challenges... Um, established ideas of, of morality and, and what is right has been curtailed in Britain for a long time and across a very broad spectrum. If you're enjoying this interview and would like to see more like it, go to navarramedia.com forward slash support. We only exist thanks to the generosity of our supporters. You can make a one-off payment or you can become an ongoing supporter. Either is fine and we are incredibly grateful to everybody who helps us keep going. It's only thanks to your kindness that Navarra Media even exists. Now, on with the interview. I'm really glad you started with that, Rowan. I think it's it's just completely spot on. You know, as we're speaking right now, Julian Assange, probably the most influential media figure, I think, of the last 10 plus years, easily, is in Belmarsh Prison. Mm -hmm. And you've got people like Dominic Raab talk about media freedom overseas. And this is a guy who's in prison. The reason why he's not being extradited, and you have to give credit to the, for the judge for the judgment they made, was because they viewed him as a suicide risk in the US prison system. And yet still, even in light of that, he won't be released uh, here. He's still in you know, a very high security prison. Belmarsh is not, a, you know, it's not a category C, it's not a walk in the park. This is a punishment being inflicted upon a journalist because, like you say, they undertook certain things which 
aggrieved the wrong kind of people, i.e. the American security establishment and to a lesser extent the British security establishment. So I think it's really important to say that and it's not it's not gone away in the slightest. There's a great book. Now you, you talked about the First World War, but the Second World War too, as we've mentioned before privately, you know, a great book by Clive Ponting, 1940, um, I think Myth and Reality. And, you know, he talks about very clear cases of people during the early years of the Second World War, particularly 1940, this kind of debacle, which is what it was with Dunkirk and uh, with the campaign in, in Scandinavia, in, in Norway, the US hadn't entered the war. Very difficult time for Britain, the biggest political crisis this country had had all the way through, I think, to COVID. And there were people that were going to prison for five years for saying that they thought Hitler was a good man. Now, of course, I don't agree with that. I think it's a disgusting thing to say, particularly in hindsight, knowing what we know now. But it's fair to say that it wasn't. And you might say that was justified. It was a country at war. But that that doesn't that doesn't strike me as a, you know, a part of the national myth. And if you said that to people, they would say, oh, I can't believe that. You know, they're not hurting anybody. It's just words. No, this is like you say, it was a fundamental part of, of, of Britain's approach to security. Yeah, and it I'm kind of, for me... Go Sorry, I was, I was going to say, I mean, those two points come together, Aaron, at a very interesting um, uh, departure, which is that the, the Daily Worker was censored. People forget this. Like the Daily Worker, which was at that stage, because the Communist Party in Britain was significant and it was linked into the labor movement and so on, it was substantially censored during the Second World War. And that was both an attack on journalism and the, the, the right to have, you know, reporting on a whole series of questions, for instance, at that stage, you know, what workers' perspective was on rearmament and all of these kind of questions. Um, but also it was a political uh, maneuver um, and, and a, a kind of attempt to keep um, uncomfortable politics out of uh, the public sphere uh, like the second world war was really quite f basically full of censorship in britain and it's it's not been digested properly i don't think there's very some very good history on it but in terms of the public sphere again this the kind of mythology about free speech britain doesn't work when you look at the history well if you look at dunkirk for instance you know again go, going back to that book clive ponting 1940 it was a great propaganda victory for the British state. And again, you're at war. You have to do that. You can't say, we've just suffered this abject defeat. We thought the French would be in this war for a lot longer than they were. They've just been destroyed by the Wehrmacht. We've just, you know, we, we thought actually France was the most powerful army in Europe. That was the kind of common sense before 1939. And it's just been, it's just fallen away in, in a matter of weeks confronting, you know, the, the, the Third Reich. Of course, you don't say that, you know, so obviously that's what happens when you're at war. But again, like you say, even today, you would have thought 80 years later, people would be in receipt of the facts about what happened with Dunkirk. The fact it was this utter debacle, the fact that it wasn't, you know, this even this film made in 2017 by, I think, Christopher Nolan. You know, it was these pontoons, these small ships that were bringing people back. It wasn't. I think three quarters of the people brought back were on Royal Navy ships and and overtly at the time, you had people, again, it's all a matter of public record, military intelligence, senior people who would say openly to journalists, you, you need to tell a certain kind of story here. Now, I mean, we're not talking about censorship in the media and propaganda. That's a separate thing. We're talking about freedom of speech. But I think you're right to say, Ron, and we can't really, you know, necessarily disaggregate the two when talking about freedom of speech within the context of Britain. No, Is that fair? certainly can't with journalism because you, you mentioned Julian Assange at the start of that. And I think it's, a, it's an important and worthwhile case. Um, that is obviously uh, an instance where somebody is uh, producing information that's in the public interest uh, and is being given such an extraordinary punishment for it in terms of his life being destroyed that it amounts to the same as uh, a censorship in my view and it and is certainly what it is is a, is a direct attack on uh, on his speech and people there's a memory hole really where a lot of the details of this case has gone like GCHQ operatives went into the Guardian and had them destroy hard drives in a newspaper headquarters in 2014 yeah. Yeah. over the Assange case. The yeah. Guardian has never been as radical again as prepared to challenge the national security state again after that incident. And people just want us to forget all of it. Before we came on air, we were talking about the history of this as well, the recent history. So we're not going back here to World War One or World War Two, but you know the 1980s and 90s, um, and 
I obviously, you know, have been talking a little bit about this in relation to the Pogues and the censorship of their song about the Birmingham Six and Guildford Four. But there's a much broader context to what was going on with the censorship of the Irish Republican movement at that point. Um, in 1985, an interview with Martin McGuinness that was done by the BBC was directly censored by by the state. It was political interference. It caused a mass NUJ walkout um, because it was seen quite rightly by those journalists who were engaged in it um, to be an act of censorship. And instead of responding to that walkout with a kind of, you know, classical British defense of free speech, what actually happened was between 1988 and 1994, um, all voices of uh, members of the Irish Republican movement, you know, and political parties like Sinn Féin, um, were dubbed off, uh, off the TV and off radio. You couldn't hear them. They had to be voiced by actors. And obviously, their statements were kept to an absolute minimum. This is at a time when, you know, political parties were running in elections um, and, you know, were standing for public positions and their representatives couldn't be heard in their own voice on uh, on the the radio on television i mean it's i have to say it's just absurd to have a, a discussion as if this country is like say for instance the united states um and i'll talk a little bit as well about something that's more relevant directly to tribune and to me now because this country also has some of the most restrictive libel laws in the world people travel to london to file lawsuits on particular issues because it is so incredibly uh, difficult to write something and make an argument about somebody uh, within British uh, or English in this in that case uh, libel laws. There's slightly different ones in England and Scotland, but they're both extremely um, extremely punitive. And those libel laws basically allow a situation to emerge where if you want as a journalist to write something about someone, you have to know beforehand that you have a deep enough pocket of money that you yeah. can sustain a case, even if like that case is completely frivolous. The, the way in which the libel law is set up, all they have to do is tie you up for, you know, two, three, four, five um, years in some cases. Mm. Uh, certainly, it can be multiple years in a long legal battle that you then have to pay for out of pocket and you're very unlikely to get all your costs back. And so even if you've been vindicated by the case, you're still going to take a huge hit on it. And so very wealthy people know in Britain today that they can just go around suing everyone who says anything inconvenient about them. And unless you represent a big corporate you know, entity, um, you're very unlikely to be able to fight your corner. So Tribune at the moment, and this is the first time you've said this publicly, uh, Tribune is being sued. Um, Tribune is subject to uh, to a libel case. Uh, it is entirely, in my view, um, a frivolous case. It is not a case that has any substance, and we're going to fight it, and I think we're going to win it. Um, I can't say any more. I'm legally restricted from saying any more about it. It's not related to the Labour Party before people go off on, on that <laughs> uh, tangent. Um, but it is a very serious case uh, insofar as if we were to lose it, it would be the end of all of the work we've done to build this publication over uh, over two and a half years. Mm. And, you know, we, even right now, it, it, we are being tied up and all, a huge proportion of our kind of resources, our time and effort is being tied up in uh, mounting a defense, a defense for a case, which, to be frank, when people see the details of it, they will be amazed it is, it is a case in which we have said something that there is absolutely ample evidence uh, to, to demonstrate. And it's a case that, you know, uh, we, we really shouldn't be involved in. But the nature, we are, because the nature of, of libel law in this country is such that it makes it extremely difficult to publish things. It makes it extremely difficult to say things. And, and even if you don't win the cases, you still tie people up in huge amounts of, of, uh, of work with lawyers that cost an awful lot of money and in which who knows whether they're going to get their, um, whether they're going to get their uh, uh, costs back. In the vast majority of cases, they don't have costs, to costs totally covered. We've talked about this history of censorship. We've talked about, um, you know, Britain has these, these well, England and Scotland, they have slightly different laws, but they're both pretty bad. Um, have these terrible libel laws, you, you, you know, basically your, your ability to get justice depends entirely on how wealthy you are. Why, given all of this, you know, and we don't have a constitutional right to freedom of speech like in the US, particularly if the Tories want to get rid of certain legislation that's 
some relates to the EU, most of it doesn't, the European Convention on Human Rights, if we were to somehow escape that, you know, our, our codified rights would be even worse than they presently are. Why, why in all of light, in light of all that, are most Brit, or many Brits, particularly small C conservative, you know, on the right, center right Brits, why do they believe that for some reason Britain is this paragon of freedom of speech when there's absolutely no evidence for it? Where do you think that comes from? What kind of, what kind of need is that addressing or meeting? I think uh, the, the concept of freedom of speech has been turned on its head. You know, speech is really a question of power. Your ability to say things um, that threaten uh, people is a question of, of power. And that, that really, when it boils down to it, is what free speech is about. Um, because in the first instance, you know, uh, anyone can go around uh, just voicing opinions if it doesn't inconvenience people uh, and without a platform, it's not going to be picked up. It's not going to be a topic worthy of discussion. What becomes a topic worthy of discussion is when somebody gets a platform to say things. Um, and obviously in Britain, you've got a context where half of all the newspapers, more than half of all the newspapers people mm. read every day are owned by News UK, Rupert Murdoch's News UK and the Daily Mail Group. Uh, and so a huge proportion of these platforms are tilted to the right. So when people have, you know, that kind of platform to project their views across society or when they're saying things that fundamentally threaten established interests and power and that it, it's within that paradigm, you have to see the question of, of freedom of speech, because freedom of speech is really most fundamentally challenged when it when people are able to project a subversive opinion across a wide um, section of, of society. But and Ronan, Ronan, here's the thing, and I'm sure you found this too. You know, I remember doing BBC Any Questions in you know rural Devon years ago, mm -hmm. and Ben Bradshaw, of all people, Labour MP, tried to shut me down and said, why is he here? And then, you know, I think it was um, uh, Jonathan Dimbleby said, well, you know, we, we believe in freedom of expression and people can, you know, say, say their views as long as they're not, as they're not hurting anyone. And all the audience clapped. And I do think this, that, that, that meme, and everyone clapped, but they, they did. And I think it goes to the core of what people think of themselves, particularly as, as, as British people, as English people. They, they think, yeah, the freedom of speech, freedom of expression, you can say what you like as long as you're not hurting. Yes. You can do what you like as long as you're not hurting somebody. That kind of a libertarian sort of almost, you know, inherent libertarian politics, people genuinely believe in it. It's not like they, they believe in it, they don't practice it. They genuinely believe in it. They think it matters. They think it's important. Yet this is so at odds with the kind of legal framework and like you say, the, the political economy of the media. So why do they believe it? I, 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 it's well, a really big a question. Piece, but um, uh, You know, to, to, to give away a little bit about our new issue, which is just launching at the moment, you have a piece in there discussing um, liberals and their understanding of their own history. And I think, again, this is something that gets right to the core of it. So Britain has an understanding of its liberal tradition, um, which is informed by a whole series of important philosophers of the liberal tradition, which come out of the kind of uh, English political sphere. And that makes a certain sense. Um, people learn about this and that tradition in, in their, their schooling to some degree. Certainly, if they go on to learn about politics at, at higher level, um, they do. And there is this idea that um, that that is quite written into the fabric of the, the British state. Um, and there's, all, of course, all of these discussions about, you know, people's rights and the Magna Carta and so on. Exactly. Uh, which which are a big part of the identity of, of being British. And I understand that. And But then that has to be counterposed against the reality, um, which is that uh, when you're discussing who can speak and what they can say, um, which is the, that, that fundamental set of questions, uh, you have to look at the history of it, which is that the reality uh, for most of the 20th century was that people who were saying things that was challenging British foreign policy, the British security services, the wealthiest um, you know, major corporations, British society, its major political figures in governments, um, they were all subject to enormous restrictions. And therein you get the, again, the, the distinction. I think the Tories, you know, are, are not stupid in what they're doing here. This is quite a, a successful culture war campaign that they're running. Mm. Uh, and we may come to some discussions about, about why that might be in universities and so on in, in, the, next, um, in the next piece of this conversation. Um, but th what they're doing is they're cynically uh, manipulating the space that exists between the popular understanding of, of Britain's own history and an identity around what it means to be British and freedom and free speech and so on. And the reality 
of all of these right-wing governments, to be frank, which have been almost, not entirely, because Tony Blair did <clears throat> plenty by way of censorship as well, whether we call him right-wing or not. I mm. certainly would, but anyway. Um, all of these governments throughout the 20th century, um, which have... Uh, which you know have have instituted very significant restrictions uh, on free speech and which have allowed a situation to develop um where speech is so incredibly controlled in britain because ownership of the press mm. and ownership of the media is so controlled so you have this newspaper um uh, circuit um the print press where half of what people read every day as we said is owned by two corporations that then massively informs what is put out in broadcast media and even broadcast media then itself in turn is subject to a huge amount of political pressure so with the bbc obviously the government of the day uh, as we now know with all of these discussions about the new leadership in the bbc um has its role in in selecting um uh, who's going to oversee the bbc and there's a whole other conversation which relates to ofcom because for a long period of time, you know, Ofcom as well throughout the 20th century and, and the regulatory bodies throughout the 20th century uh, when it comes to, to television um, were involved in regular exercises of censorship, not just on like this or that program can't go on, but, you know, in terms of content of programs, in terms of censoring words in programs, censoring scenes in programs and so on. Um, and there has been a more concerted effort with Ofcom recently uh, I remember Theresa May's uh, Queen's speech a number of years ago about the need for Ofcom to be involved in the restriction of extremist views and attempt to kind of uh, integrate Ofcom into the broader anti-terror, counter-terrorism counter mm. nexus, which is so restrictive of the right to, to free speech and, and you know, and, and the, so determinative in many cases of who can say something and what they can say in Britain. Um, and, you know, that was that was a key uh a key moment uh, in the progression of Ofcom. It didn't get anywhere near enough scrutiny. And now this question, you know, this idea we're going to have Paul Dacre of the Daily Mail, who, you know, ran years long hate campaigns against the left through that institution um, and argued, you know, the Daily Mail was as far as you could imagine from a free speech champion uh, for most of that period of time, because it spent its, its, uh, uh, its time pursuing uh, and persecuting um, lefty academics, um, NGOs, people in the civil service who might have had pro-labor yeah. views. Uh, I mean, this is a, not a publication that had any kind of respect for, um, for broad opinions. What it basically did was uh, have a very narrow understanding of what was patriotic and uh, uh, which suited the right wing. And anyone who went outside of that was smeared ruthlessly as a terrorist sympathizer, as a red, as a whatever. And this is now the person who's going to be in charge of Ofcom. So yeah, I, I, I think we have, uh, there's the, what, what I would say about the Tories, you know, um, and it, it applies to history and their understanding of all that as well. Um, the mythology, the mythology suits them much better than the reality. Uh, and that is uh, what they are playing on with these, these kind of campaigns. Let's move to the sort of the nub of, of the conversation, because I think, you know, much of our audience would agree, you know, the, the right and the Tories don't really mean what they say on freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Do you think the left has failed on freedom of speech? Do you think it's failing on freedom of speech? Do you think it's failing to defend freedom of speech as a principle, but also in practice? And if that is the case, when did it happen? When did this shift take place where the left no longer viewed itself as wanting to defend freedom of speech. Uh, and now we're in a different place. Or do you think, again, that's just a right-wing canal? So two questions there, I suppose. Look, I think the left has a problem of understanding around speech. And I've, I've been saying this for, for some time now, um, which is that people think because there is some degree of uh, cultural superiority uh, or for certain social liberal ideas at this moment in time, that that mm. means that the left has an extraordinary amount of power. And therefore, we should be getting involved, you know, alongside, say, major social media corporations or university management or whatever else in, in policing um, uh, people's right to, to say certain things. But what that inevitably does, and in fact, what that is already doing, is making a stick for our own back. Because uh, when it comes down to it, the people who really have the power to decide who can say something and what they can say, um, are people who own things, the people in state power, the people who, you know, exert control in our society. And the left has none of those positions. And so 
here and there we might run you know a campaign um to get this or that person sacked you know say for instance some some person has a, a view that we dislike um in a, in a university department um i could think you know you could imagine a scenario for instance in universities where an economist comes out with some very extreme uh, view on on pro austerity and whatever and the left starts firing around petitions but mm. actually what's far more likely to happen is that some sociologist who says something um radical in defense of you know uh, um a group that might have an armed wing or whatever else is much more likely to get themselves sacked uh, because mm. the left is not the one making the decisions and so I I think in this in this instance the left has got uh, a misunderstanding uh, about what its own power is in society um they're not seeing clearly enough that having won some of the kind of post 60s social uh, uh, battles uh, doesn't actually give you a huge amount of institutional uh, power uh, and the other uh, side of it is that engaging in this kind of in a censorious campaign i think has become a particular tactic of the left uh, because other tactics have been diminished and this yeah. is part of a this is part of a bigger uh, discussion and it's part of why the cynicism of this tory campaign is so important for us to understand mm. which is that the tories are pursuing universities right now because they're the final place where radical voices have any degree of institutional power so the unions have been smashed and we have no institutional power in the economy the radicals have largely been driven out of civil society organizations the ngos have been almost totally taken over by corporate uh, liberals and so forth so the last place that there are radicals who can come out and say something that is really challenging um uh, about you know particularly the economy but about politics and society and culture and so on more generally um is in the university sector and uh, having pursued us uh, out of all the, the these other parts of society the right is now coming for the universities as a final attempt to marginalize radical voices and that's why this campaign is so important for us to fight back against mm. because it is a question of whether or not radical voices have institutional positions in society and can speak freely on things so so does that mean then that because as a principle and i agree i think most people would agree with that you know maintaining freedom of speech as a principle you know, it necessarily benefits the left because we have so little leverage just, you know, institutionally, whether it's in the media, whether it's in politics. Does that therefore mean you give a pass to things which you find reprehensible? I mean, how, how does that work in practice? Because I, I agree with you. If a, if a right-wing economist says austerity was good, I think the guy's wrong. I think he's an asshole, whatever, but I, I, I don't think he should necessarily lose his job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, right. an e that, that's an easy example. But if somebody talks about eugenics or, you know, Toby Young is a good example. Um, you know, it wasn't that serious a role. He's a bit of a not serious guy. So it's kind of people don't need to necessarily think it through. But if somebody's attending sort of eugenics conferences and so on, you know, are they are they in the right, you know, place um, professionally, uh, intellectually to be to be overseeing Britain's institutions, Brit Britain's universities? Well, do, do, so I yeah. guess this sort of feeds into the question of, you know, do, is there I, I think there is such a thing as a hate crime. But of course, where do you draw the line? I mean, so what, how does the left respond to those cases? Because obviously there's, there's often very egregious instances. Yes, yes, uh, there are. Uh, I'm I'm one of these people. I don't have a, a total, um, like I'm not a, a free speech champion that says that I, I have no critical position on it because my view is that speech is very much related to power. And the second you, you divorce it from that question, you try and establish uh, principles that don't uh, interact with the realities of the world in terms of who has power to dictate who, who can say something, what they can say, well, then you get off into a kind of fantasy land. But I'm very broadly uh, pro-free speech. And when we talk specifically about universities, because that's a number of the examples you brought up, I'm very uh, defensive of uh, academic freedom and of tenure. Because mm. I think that if we're going to defend, and, and I do have a principal position here, my, my view is that universities and the higher education and adult education, lifelong learning and so on, they're about the critical pursuit of knowledge. Yeah. And so much of what's happened over the reforms of recent you know, years and decades has been diminishing of that. I want to come back to that in a second, because I think it's really important within universities to raise the question of, well, actually, who's restricting what can be said? and what processes are. But we have to defend academic freedom and we have to defend tenure because these are the pillars on which uh, 
uh, you base a free exchange of ideas and you can actually have a, a you know an institutional position for radical voice within uh, disciplines in universities only because when campaigns come on from you know major media outlets to demonize radical academics um to you know say that they're brainwashing your kids and they're you know teaching them all this kind of uh, anti-british stuff or whatever it is they're going on about it is only the framework Let's, let's not kid ourselves in a moment when our universities are so cap in hand for money and so like determined to get corporate sponsorship. It's only the frameworks of academic freedom and tenure that save these people's positions. And like a lot of the radical academics that get attacked in the media, being totally frank, like I don't agree with them on lots of things, particularly postmodern academics who spend huge proportions of their careers attacking Marxism, socialism, the broader left. Like I don't agree with them, but you know, they're really important. And one of the reasons they're really important, and I think it's very important for us to defend them, is that they open doors. The number of people who go into classrooms with uh, radical academics who simply put different kinds of texts there, that doesn't mean that it's all left-wing texts, it can be right-wing texts, it can be whatever, but who are willing to put texts that are heterodox on mm. their syllabuses, those open doors that people then begin to walk down and, and think about it. I, I mean, I remember I had that experience with reading Foucault in university. I mean, I have no time now for Michel Foucault as a, as a social theorist, um, but the fact that I was given the exposure to reading Foucault was actually pretty important because it took me down into Foucault and then the critiques of Foucault and then questions of radicalism and then what had happened mm -hmm. in the post-60s period, the nature of the welfare state. And before the end of it, I ended up with, you know, quite advanced sets of understandings um, uh, that are that are running counter to mainstream understandings of the, of the 20th century. And it's because that door was opened. And so this is why we have to defend it. And we have to have a discussion more broadly about the universities as well, because the right is running a campaign right now about, you know, it's these wild students who are, you know, uh, trying to, to get everyone sacked in universities um, with their no platforming tactics and whatever. Um, and I'm not going to defend all of that. And we've just had a discussion about, you know, my belief that we shouldn't be calling for people to be to be sacked. I think it's a, it's a, a stupid uh, tactic and it's also in principle wrong. But... There is a, a broader question here, which is I remember the post-crash economics discussion after the 2008 crash when students had to come together and demand that their universities include some more left-wing economists mm. in uh, the, the economics departments, some more heterodox economists in the economics departments, because what they were seeing happening in front of their eyes day to day on television no longer made sense mm. against what they were learning in their, in their syllabuses. Yeah. And that is actually the reality of British universities. Certainly the, sec the sections of those universities that really have something to say about power, the politics departments, the economics departments, and so on, the history departments, these are not run by, in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, by like wild-eyed radicals. It's a complete nonsense. If you have, and, and I have to say, you know, it doesn't mean, I, I read quite a lot of um, uh, 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 historians who are not left-wing, and I'm interested uh, in quite a lot of like, earlier social history i think that you know bbc's program in our time and whatever is a really fantastic um a, a kind of way to show off the interesting historical discussions that are going on inside british universities but it's a total canard right to believe that uh the british universities and their history departments are all being run by radicals. They're being run in the vast majority of cases by pretty conservative mainstream establishment historians. And you've got the odd radical voice here and there dotted around the place. And it's the same with most other departments, most other disciplines. There are a few that have more sociology and so on, have more, but not that many. And that's the reality of what universities look like. Yeah. But can I, can, I, can I just say, Ron, as well, it, just, it, it goes back to your point about money and resources and power. Because if you take UCL, for instance, recently, there's a bit of a fight there about adoption of the IHRA. Uh, now, you, you might think that's a, a, a good thing. They should adopt it. You might think it's a bad thing. They shouldn't adopt it. What I think is inarguable, I don't think they should adopt it. It's my personal view. But that, that's kind of irrelevant because what matters is, like you say, if they get enough pushback on whatever decision, if, if corporate donors don't want to get involved, if people who are leaving their money, you know, sort of in their in their legacies and their will, uh, al alumni who are sort of, you know, wealthy and giving them money regularly, if they start to say this isn't really acceptable, you know, to what extent is there academic freedom at UCL to adopt one position or the other? Because money talks. Because right now, universities, to an extent we've really not ever seen before, have been subordinated to profit and to capitalism. 
right? Fundamentally, you, you need money to exist, which 40 years ago, 50 years ago, wasn't necessarily the case for universities. Now, I'm not saying they were more enlightened 40 or 50 years ago, but like you say, the extent to which uh, power, resources, money inhibits freedom of expression, uh, freedom of intellectual curiosity, I, I think that's inarguable. And it's clearly only going in one direction. Absolutely. And it's actually the structure of the modern university, which is the most restrictive thing uh, in terms of setting the terrain for what can be said uh, and who can say it. Because the truth of it is that the modern university, like the vast majority of big and important research decisions are made with corporate sponsorship in mind mm. at the very least, if not are made on the back of what funding is available from who to be able to do what research, which means that, and this is not just in sciences. I mean, it, it, it's not just in, in the kind of hard sciences and natural sciences and whatever. It happens in the social sciences to some extent as well, um, where questions are being asked over your ability to pursue things on the basis of what money is available. And then who's making mm. the decision over what money is available? Well, in many cases, uh, certainly, you know, when we think of the, the role that big pharma is now playing in universities. And I know we have all this debate about the vaccine and so on. We can get into it at a later stage. But whatever you think about that outcome, the process by which big pharmaceutical corporations can decide how huge amounts of university resources are, are deployed is obviously a question of determining who's allowed to pursue what research and where. And that applies actually across the university. The big money is shaping what is what you can pursue and what you can't. And you know what else is shaping it is the process of uh, university staff being casualized, university mm. staff being yeah. underpaid for their work. Yeah. Uh, and and the fact that academics are being forced into a hamster wheel um, to produce more and more and more kind of papers or publications in order that universities can rank in a certain way in uh, league tables in order that then those universities can attract more international sponsorship and more international students and more money in as part of a kind of commercial racket. And mm. those academics who are being forced into that hamster wheel, they can't actually uh, go about saying what they want to say. They can't go about, you know, writing on the topics they really want to write about or pursue, because what they're being forced to do is to simply churn out as many papers and as many kind of topics uh, as they can in order to get the university more points in this in this system. And the same, by the way, with academics who have got precarious working positions or casualized and whatever else. Well, what happens when they go and say something controversial? Their yeah. prospects of not getting rehired, their prospects of getting sacked and whatever are all much higher. And the right doesn't want to engage in any of this debate. It doesn't want to engage in any serious structural debate about what is influencing the modern university and what it's pursuing. Uh, the left has to be able to step into that sphere. And this is why the freedom of speech discussion is important. The defense of academic freedom, the defense of tenure. We have to be able to step in and defend the idea of the university as a site of learning. The idea of not just learning, I have to say, in the university set setting, because the truth is we have undervalued other forms of learning. We've allowed this idea that a degree is just a stamp and your right to give you a professional job at some later point. People go on and get masters just so they can, you know, have a little bit more than a BA to get up the employment ladder a bit further. We have to break the idea of an education system that's totally instrumentalized towards the economy, the jobs market and profit at the end of the day and fight for one that's about the critical pursuit of knowledge, which is the old idea, the enlightenment idea of the university. And that should be ours to defend because actually the biggest threat to the enlightenment idea of the university is the marketization of higher education, which is back entirely by the Tories. But look, there, there are other aspects here. Um, you've ran, you, you mentioned the IHRA definition. The Israel-Palestine um, debate is a hugely important structuring debate over, over speech in universities at the moment that the right-wing free speech champions have basically nothing to say about. And it's mm. not just the IHRA definition, which I agree with you. Univer I don't think it should be anywhere near universities. I don't think it should be anywhere near universities because you've got it immediately at that point, you are placing extraordinary limits on academic freedom uh, by using a different kind of context, you by using the context about safe spaces and whether or not, you know, there is discrimination and so on, you're infringing on academic freedom discussions, which should be being held actually on their own basis. You, you raise the question so, of eugenics. Well, a good academics freedom uh, uh, discussion will deal with eugenics by saying, is this 
good, principled, decent research, or is this pseudoscientific nonsense? Mm. And if a person is engaged in pseudoscientific nonsense that has no basis that they cannot prove, well, then I think you've got a much stronger case yeah. within a, the, a university of you know critical inquiry to make to make an argument against that person. And that should be the way in which things are dealt with, not on the basis, for instance, of whether this person is creating a safe space or, 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 or not for, for students. And also because the safe space concept is a fundamentally uh, misleading one. I understand why uh, it, it came about, but it's misleading. Uh, it, it hasn't de developed any kind of uh, position of power for the left more, more generally. In fact, it's more often being used now, as we can see through the discussion over Israel-Palestine against us, um, and also through some of the prevent discussions. I'll come to that in a, in a second. Um, but it's also just not how uh, these things work when we say, oh, this or that is not, a, not up for debate. Like, you know, a person's life is not up for debate. Well, you know, Irish people could have said that very easily in the 1980s and 90s, you know, our, our rights aren't up for debate. Well, I'm sorry, but they are, and they were. And we do need to win political institutional battles to try to defend them. But like when people were being shot dead for for, for you know, demonstrating for civil rights, the, whether or not you say you, you, your life is not a subject of debate is kind of irrelevant. It is a subject of debate. And you've got to both be able to win the debate in the public sphere on the, that question over, oh, you know, your right to civil rights, as it would have been in that case. And you've got to be able to win the political battles that actually, you know, secure those rights in the in the real world. I think that's spot on. I, I just want to say, Ron, I think, you know, speaking as somebody who's, you know, British Iranian, mm -hmm. there are, you know, there's, there's a... a, a a dearth of um, of IR academics, more more so in the United States, who, who I think you know a lot of their presumptions and their you know their way of viewing the world and interpreting facts, I think is kind of is kind of racist. I think that. H however, like you say, I mean, does that does that mean I therefore think that uh, schol scholars in the kind of the realist school of international relations theory that they should because I don't really like them and I think what they're saying is kind of actually this is kind of incontrovertible if you look at the kind of the the that pipeline between ideas and then the sort of neoconservatives which sur surrounded Bush in the White House, Bush Jr. You know, you could say, well, this is deeply, you know, unacceptable to to, to people of Middle Eastern heritage, Iranians, Iraqis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And like you say, I, I, particularly in the university, you know, you can have these debates in various other institutions. I don't think the IHRA should be adopted by the Labour Party. I mean, that's again just my opinion. But at least with a political party, you can say. We have an executive. These are our values. We don't think this is congruent with our values. That's a different argument. I think you're quite right to make this difference with the university, where it's more about a sort of there's a meta debate going on, where actually fundamentally the, the point of the organisation is not that you're congruent with our values, but actually we we have a, a range of views which we kind of try, you know, we 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 we, we try and enable and to inspire and and hopefully that there can be productive productive agreements and disagreements. So I agree with you that freedom of speech, particularly in the context of, of education, I think is is so important. And it's a little bit different to the arguments elsewhere. I I just wanted to say as well, uh, Ronan, because it, it feeds into that, that precarity and freedom of speech kind of point, feeds in as well to the media and to journalism. And we had a great example of this recently with Nathan Robinson, current affairs writer, founder, who was a columnist at The Guardian, I'll, I'll briefly reiterate the story. I'm sure our viewers are aware of it. Uh, you know, who's a columnist at the the Guardian, Guardian US, and he made an offhand comment on Twitter, which was interpreted by John Mulholland, the editor at the Guardian US, as anti-Semitic, or, or or even just not becoming of a columnist. Which ultimately, that's fine, right? That's that's what you do as an editor. Um, but rather than say, I don't think this is a wise thing to tweak. Do you please delete it, or what do you mean? He was kind of just. They didn't really respond to him anymore and he wasn't being commissioned to write articles anymore. And what this shows you is you can only do that with a freelancer. Mm. You know, you can't do that with a guy who's on contract in the union, who's in the office every, you know, every week or whatever, uh, has deep social capital with the rest of the sort of senior editorial team, other columnists and so on. But they could do it with Nathan Robinson because, you know, he is the kind of columnist which is increasingly the norm in the media industry, which is he didn't have a contract they could kind of leave him hanging, which is very much like these untenured academics. So it's not just in the in the academy and universities, but also in, in the media. And this was at The Guardian, right? This was at an institution which is meant to be one of the most progressive, liberal, you know, comment is free, apparently not. 
uh, you know, media outlets in the Anglophone world. And actually, in many ways, it is. You know, let, let's be honest, it's clearly much better than the Daily Mail and the Sun. But even there, we have a problem around freedom of speech. And like you say, this, this clear connection between resources, between political power, between the power of labor, actually, and one's ability to actually say and think what one wants. I think it's a very important point. Also, you know, let's let's remind ourselves again when we talk about speech and power that in the last five, six years in Britain, there has been a leader of one of the two major parties who has had no major newspaper, TV station, whatever, no major media outlet that reflected his views or that gave him support. The left, actually, in the broader context of speech in Britain, is basically written out of the picture here. The real, yeah. you know, the, the left, and by that I mean, for me, it means socialists. None of the newspapers, major newspapers, reflect our lines. We're very consistently left out of the conversations that happen on BBC, ITV, even, even on Sky, slightly less there has to be said, but even still in places like that. So we are basically uh, denied uh, on a much broader scale. You know, the right are running these campaigns around who's invited to like student debate societies. Uh, there, there's some importance there. By the way, it's not the same as academic freedom in those places. This is a student debate society. It's not whether someone has tenure or, or not. And I think those are very distinct and different questions. Um, but they're going crazy about this or that person not being invited or being deep, you know, uh, invite being rescinded or whatever from a student debate society what about a whole massive section of society who was for a period of time you know reflected in the leadership of the labor party who have no media institution that will go to bat for them the guardian and the mirror to a significant extent the new statesman they were actually more aggressively anti-left and anti-socialist throughout the corbyn period than even the right wing was in many instances and so, the, but there's no discussion of that because they don't have an interest in, in having a real debate about speech. And you know what? This is true across the board for the right because one minute they're going on about we need to have free speech in society. It's a very important thing, um, you know, and, and in universities and whatever else. And the next minute what they're saying is, like Michael Gove when he introduced that new curriculum uh, uh, for history, oh, we only need to be teaching patriotic history and all this mm. anti British anti-empire history has to be written out. One minute you're getting a line from the Tory government, which is like, we need free speech czars in our universities. The next minute you're getting the culture secretary coming out and saying that um, in the case of the National Trust, when it did a report into the history of some of the properties and empire and slavery and whatever else, that, you know, we need to stop this anti-British propaganda in our institutions. And so they, they want a particular version of history to be taught, they want to, you know, attack pretty viciously in their tabloids and with their platforms as government ministers in a public sense. Anyone who steps across the line uh, into critical analysis of uh, Britain's history and actually analysis of the reality of what mm. happened under the empire, which is nowhere near analysed enough, completely to the contrary of what the Tories say about the kind of history people get in schools in Britain and even into the universities, there's nowhere near enough discussion of the atrocities which was committed in uh, very many colonised countries in, in, in Britain's name. And yet what they want is, and they're running an active you know, campaign at the same time as they're running a culture war campaign over free speech, they're running a culture war campaign over, you know, let's marginalise or completely remove from the public sphere anyone who has critical view on British imperial history. They're complete hypocrites, I'm afraid. Um, and it, by the way, it, it goes even broader than that. You think of Pretty Patel and, and the kind of, you know, campaign that she's running over free speech and making it a big part of her, um, uh, her position and her kind of political discourse uh, at the moment that we need to defend free speech. And then we find out that actually the government is supporting, through John Woodcock of all people, um, an inquiry into progressive terrorism and into, you know, like the activities of far left groups and all the rest of it. Somebody when John Woodcock, you couldn't pick, a, a, aside from a bigger idiot, you couldn't pick a more like prejudiced person to run an inquiry on that basis because he spent his entire bloody life uh, involved in like battled back and forth with people who are socialists and particularly in recent years 
And and so, like, you know, we all know what he's going to end up saying about this. But the same government that's arguing, well, we need free speech for people, then turns around and says, well, we need to look into, you know, all of this kind of stuff that's too radical that environmental groups and whatever are doing. And that, you know, is part of a context, too, with the spy cops bill and the fact that progressive groups in, the, in a wildly disproportionate uh, instance, only a handful mm-hmm. of far right groups were looked into, we now know because of the spike ops inquiry, you know, the government is quite happy to to go in and send its agents into progressive groups to snoop on us. It has a massive surveillance apparatus. We just discussed what the GCHQ did uh, when it came to the Guardian. And yes, somehow the Tories are the defenders of, of like free speech and and critical debate in the public sphere. It is a farce. It's a complete farce. And the people in the media who, like, outside of the right wing, who are just cynical about it, uh, the people in the broader media sphere who engage with them as if uh, they're honest actors or good faith actors are are dupes at best. Final question, Ronan, because you've talked about, I think it's a good analysis of what of what the truth is. But what does the left do about it? How, how, how can the left assert, reassert itself as a champion of freedom of expression, freedom of speech? Or do you think that's simply not possible, given you've got this sort of structural economic analysis of things? I mean, is the answer, oh, well, we need to own the Sun newspaper, or are things a little bit easier than that? I think we need to defend the public sphere. I think it is important. Uh, so more broadly than that, we need to, to be able to have arguments um, about what kind of political debate, uh, broad political debate that allows heterodox ideas should be sustained in society and how that should be sustained. And we should be leading that debate instead of allowing terms like free speech to be totally co-opted and taken by the right who don't believe in any of it. Because unless we do that, the truth is, we'll be the ones shut out. It is a principal point. It's a principal point, certainly for universities. It's a principal point because we should believe in those enlightenment ideas of the critical pursuit of knowledge that sustain the institution of the university. But it's also a point around politics and that people have to be really clear that we're not the ones who have the power in society to dictate the terms of the debate. It's not really us who gets to police it. Despite what a few like big corporations who have BLM flags or gay pride flags at certain times a year might lead you to believe. The truth is a small amount of like power, social or cultural power in terms of liberalism doesn't translate to any significant power for the left. And then the bigger question of all this is, as well as us making a, 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 an argument over uh, speech and the public sphere in society, we have to do the practical work because we can go and make principal cases about these things free speech, the public sphere, critical pursuit, knowledge, and all the rest. The right doesn't care about any of them. They're, they're going to have their free speech unions. They're going to have all this kind of stuff. Mm. Maybe it's a culture war kind of thing. They're not going to care. And what they're certainly not going to do is allow a scenario to emerge where actually we have a platform, like a significant media outlet where we can voice our opinions or where, you know, we have think tanks on the same kind of scale that they would have or, you know, where we have anywhere near the number of academics even um, with like properly radical views or these socialist, Marxist or even some of the postmodern ones in these big uh, institutions, say like in any economics departments we're a million miles away from having you know, any any kind of significant number of socialist economists in the economics departments of british universities and they're never going to change any of that so we have to begin to adopt institutional analyses and it does start with the question of the media because you the, the media is a is a key fulcrum of the public sphere it's what the tories are running this campaign over the university sector and so on yeah. through and we have no voice in it you know, the Guardian occasionally gives access to a few radicals here and there, but they only do it just to sustain an audience. They hate us. They absolutely hate us. Uh, and we have to have our own. And that means going back to some of the discussions the left was having back in the 80s, uh, you know, where the, the news on Sunday was launched and all the rest of it. We have to actually talk about um, balancing the media landscape by having a big mass audience left-wing newspaper or uh, publication, you know, channel, whatever it is, that will begin to put a counterbalance to the kind of constant lurch to the right that outlets like, you know, GB News are just the latest example of. Mm. Great place to finish on. We're not going to have meaningful freedom of speech without a different kind of media. Ronan, thank you so much. Thanks for joining me today. Pleasure. And uh, you did so after having a difficult surgery on your shoulder, I'm told. Two weeks ago, and got a shoulder reconstruction. 
and uh, it's going all right. It's going all right. We managed to get yeah. the issue of uh, of Tribune out through it. Um, I would highly encourage people to go and look at our Twitter page and Facebook and all the rest for the latest uh, offer to subscribe to Tribune because you know we need your support in order to survive in the same way Novara does. And actually, there's a very good crossover in the latest because we have. Uh, we have the noble Aaron Bustani in the uh, latest print issue discussing um, uh, some liberal falsification of history. So uh, so I think people will be very interested in it. Well, you did a great job editing it. And it's commitment to the cause that you managed to do that whilst, uh, whilst bedridden. Thanks again, uh, Ronan. Really, really good conversation. Appreciate it. Cheers.